Okay, so let's let's get let's get our track down of what we need to do. Let's get the seasons down. Middle of October through January, we can jig them up in the shallows. October is going to be your best time. That that period, if you guys want to get big numbers of fish, I'm talking 50, 60 fish. Any what's that? In a day. No lie. 50, 60 fish in a day. Reason is, is you're going to see them. You'll go through, guys. Your graph will just go black or colored, whatever you got. These big clumps of them. When you drop the, down, the, the drop shot down, you can feel the weight hitting them on the way down. That's that, No exaggeration. It's because they're broadcast spawners. They're all condensed. It's like that pre-spawn thing, right? Then what happens once they spawn, and this is where Chad and the January thing, where they go fish deep jigging, and you started catching more big ones when you started drop shotting, right? Those fish are post-spawn. Those big hands are post-spawn. What happens during that October period where you got pre-spawn, you're getting all those big numbers, you can see those huge fish in there on the graph. You can see them. Problem is, the males are so aggressive that anything that gets down there, a female never gets to it. I mean, you may get a 15-pounder, but the 30s and stuff, it just doesn't happen. There's so many fish in there that as soon as that thing comes dropping in, wham, those males are all over it. What kind of structure do they like to spawn in? I mean, is it it's, the it's, softball-sized rock, but are they going into, like, a, a bay, or is it no, just anywhere they can find the rock? Typically, typically where, there's, where there's some wind and stuff moving through where you may have some atmospheric pressure, or not pressure, but change coming through. you got some current stuff moving through. It's not as critical as, like, a walleye where they got to have that to cultivate them, the oxygenated eggs, you know. It's not that critical with the Lakers. That's one of the reasons why they thrive so well. They don't have to travel the streams. They're pretty versatile when it comes to that. Wind blown points, the shallow reefs, any place where you've got that rock, that's the main, the main thing is where that rock's at. Because you don't really have to worry about silt getting pushed up on there. You know, it's not going to happen. Just because there's not enough influence there to do that. Come January, when he goes up there and he jigs, and he jigs down 180 feet, they catch some big fish. What they're getting is they're females that are coming down and resting. They're in that deep water resting. And that's where the, the deep water thing through the month of January can start to pay for you, where you're down 150, 180 feet. Then, when it gets tough, at the end of January into February, all of a sudden those fish aren't there and we can't jig them anymore. This year there's ice, so it that doesn't really help you. Now what you have to do, those fish are using the water column. You do the same thing you're doing in the summer. You're trolling. You're suspending your bait down. You're not dragging the bottom. You're trolling. Those fish are moving around because our water's turned over. We're warm now for quite a ways because the 39 settles. Remember how all that works. Okay, The surface is the coolest. So you'll find the bait fish will be in there at a certain level where the warm and the cold start to mix. Because remember, there's not a thermal climb in the winter. Basically got the cool water on top. You got the 39 degrees that settle. Okay? So you go to your trolling. One of the best techniques up there in the springtime, the old timers all do it, and you'll see them up there in the little 12, 14 foot boats. Lead core line, big old flatfish, trolling the shorelines. Going around the shorelines. I've gone up there in the spring of the year, that time of year, and caught them casting docks with curly tail grubs on a jig head. Off a dock, just like a bass. Reason being is the water's turned over at that time, remember? Now the, the warmer water's up high, it's still 39, 40 degrees. They're using everything. So you want to be, that's when you want to be the troller guy. End of January till about, like we said, middle to the end of May. We're trolling. Lead core line, running shallows. Then when those fish come up, and there's a couple guys that come up and they always try to troll by me when I'm up there doing the drop shot thing. They've seen the show, they know what's going on, and they're running through there with flatfish and doing their thing, and they just don't seem to pick them up. Reason being is that those fish are focused on primary food source is the pike minnow. When you go ripping through there, once again, if I'm full, Thanksgiving dinner, like we talked, mom brings a slice of pie, suddenly I can eat again. It's a small offering, little tiny three-inch Berkeley Sparkle Drop Shot Minnow. 
when this thing's got a 12 inch pikeman in its mouth, it still tried to eat it. It's something simple. It's not moving fast. It's easy to eat. If you go in there, guys, and I've tried it, I've lashed up some big old 10 inch sluggos on my drop shot, big old heavy setup, and they just won't eat it. Little three inch dude, they eat it. It's easy to eat. Their focus is on the primary pike minnow, but hey, that's just kind of dangling there. I'll eat it. Those fish come on between typically 10 and 11 that time of year, and then they're gone, and all of a sudden they make a reappearance again between 3 and 4, and then they're gone. There's a fellow that lives right where we fish. Every time I'm there, he comes out because we're cranking the fish up. I live right here. I got the video. I can see my house. <laughs> but I've never caught a fish here. They have great fireworks. What's that? They have, they have great fireworks. fireworks. Good. So, guys, what happens? He's not persistent enough. You got to get out there, and you just got to beat them up. They're there. You just don't stick with them long enough. All I want to do is get a 20-pounder. Man, You've got the video, you can see your house, you've watched me with your binoculars, it's not like I'm putting magic sauce on the end of this thing. You know, you just got to get out there and pound away at it. That's the difference between big fishing and little fishing. You can go up there and go, if you want to go catch little fish, that big, I'll take you to where there's an underground spring in 150 feet, I don't care if it's the dead of winter or it's the middle of summer, and we'll catch 80 to 100, that big. Is that fun? Well, not for us. We want the big dudes. It's a persistence thing. So then remember, once again, going into that summertime period, when they start to disappear, what do we do? We start trolling. We start working the open water, staying where we were at before. Right? Now, I can't stress enough the importance of the graph on this. Because you need to be able to locate where they're at. Now what I'm going to do is give you a little trick when you're trolling. This is going to apply when we talk to the trout too, okay? Here's what I like. Okay, Seth, here was the surface, like so. And I could see what I believe to be was the thermocline down here. And it appeared to be that there was a little heavier clutter in this area at 35 to 40 feet. So I figured that was a thermocline. I set my graph up to shoot 50. Even though we're only going down 45 feet, right? What does the 50 do? Makes the cone bigger, we can see our downrigger balls, right? I set it up, I did it just like you said. What I could see was I could see the arches in here. Okay, great. I put on a swim bait like you said, okay, great. I dropped it down, I didn't catch anything. What happened? I have old timers argue with me on this. And it's one of those things that I've done because, once again, I'm weird. I'm weird. I have a little just, everything's got to be tuned and just right. If it's 150 feet deep, right, and my fish are down here at, say, 40 feet, well, as a rule of thumb, we know that we don't want the bait below the fish because they don't look down, they look up. Okay, Seth, we got it. So I came up, and you told me that fish is at 40, so I, I went about 35 feet. And I pulled the downrigger ball through there. I didn't get anything. Okay. Well, how far off the ball were you? Well, I went from, you know, 80 feet to 200 feet to whatever. I want you to try this next time you're out. Take your downrigger ball. If you know that you're in 150 feet, and I do this in the ocean all the time, unless, like where Ken's at, where you've got to be dragging on the bottom. If you're dragging on the bottom, this won't work. It defies physics. You'll see why. When I'm fishing suspended fish, guys, whether it's Rainbow Trout, Kootenai Lake, Ponderé, we're Roosevelt, we're fishing for Lakers, whatever we're doing, I drop my ball down about 20 feet. I hook my release on. I drop it down another 15 feet. What does that do? Okay. Finesse fishing while you're trolling. What do I want to run a big old hunk of lead? And I see, I see these, I see these downrigger balls. That's orange, man. I'm pulling them to the board, or I'm pulling them to the ball. It's green. It's 
cool, whatever. Is it natural for a big old hunk of lead to go cruising through? <laughs> I don't care what color it is. Guys, I've been doing this since I was a kid. Because I always thought, that doesn't need to go ripping through there right in front of them. Anytime I'm fishing suspended, I get that ball down below the fish. So only the cable is going through. Now you don't have to go back 200 feet. Maybe you go back 50 feet. You don't have to go as far back. But think of that downrigger ball going through there like the boat going above, and if you don't have planer boards behind you, it's the dead zone. You're killing it. A lot less disturbance running the cable through there than the ball. Would you do that with coping too? Do it with everything. So long as I'm not fishing the bottom, where obviously I have no choice. But when you're dragging the bottom, like with the Lakers when you drag the bottom, I got it right in the mud. Well, what you're doing is you're kicking all that mud up, and it's making them curious when they're coming in to investigate. Different principle when they're up here. Mm -hmm. we just drag the ball. Just drag the ball. That's just so you know how where you're at in your zone. Exactly. Yep. It's like drop shot with a downrigger ball, right. if you want to call it that while you're trolling. Don't drag the ball through there. The second biggest mistake when we're trolling is, like I said last week, we do 2.2 miles an hour for 15 hours <laughs> equals one bite, <laughs> which in turn equals this. Okay? Caught the fish that was doing 2.2. <laughs> we guys we were up in the ocean out in our Crestliner 202, doing probably what we shouldn't be doing. All day long, I am standing on the back of the boat, handle in hand, all over the place because it's rough. And I'm making the old man or sitting down, like people looking at me, like, What is this? The guy's nuts. Whoa, whoa. Mm, ah! Whoa, the ball's back here. Uh -huh, it's back here. And they hit it, and they hit it, and they hit it. When something's tracking behind something, guys, when I throw out, and I'm bringing something back, pike fishing or whatever, I see a pike back there, I stop it, I speed it up, I do something crazy. Boom! It's trying to get away, it's trying to do something. Same principle when you troll. Man, don't just... Two point, that was 2.2 miles. I read these articles and it's like, wow. And it, you know, there ain't nothing swims like that. Trust me. Burst, glide, burst, glide. You know. Yeah. That's why planter board fishing in the Midwest is such a heat, because it's surging, it's creating action, it's getting you away from the disturbance of the boat. That's what it's all about. Boom. Yeah, guys, we'll take crankbaits bass fishing. They will deep dive in nasty ones and throw them in the cabbage. We did a show on it. Crank them down, they hit the cabbage. Two things. When they hit it, you can go Rah! and rip it out of there, or it hits and you just let it back up. And sometimes they'll hit it backing up, like that show. That's the only way we get them hit. And sometimes when it comes ripping out of there, they hit it. It's a change in pace. That's why you always want your crankbait to hit the bottom because it's, da -da -da, it's, da -da, it's rolling up sideways, jumping around. It's a change of pace, man. You talk to one bass guy that said, I threw my crank all day long and I just went like that. <laughs> doesn't happen. It just doesn't happen. It's the same thing trolling, guys. They are a predator. They want to eat things. Things try to get away. They don't go, hey, oh, oh. You know? Fred, I was out cruising at 2.2 and they chased me and that guy died. No. It doesn't work that way. Below. I always drop the ball down, then I hook up and drop it. I want the ball below the fish. 